Hello there. This is part two commentary I'm doing on my Bloodborne Skull Chalice project, where I'm taking a 2D asset from the game Bloodborne and turning it into this 3D animation. In this video, I'll be going over the texturing process and substance painter and blender. If you would like to see how I sculpted this bad boy first, definitely go watch part one of this series. So let's dive right in. And we're starting off in Blender, doing the oh so fun part of the process, UV unwrapping. Now here I have my final sculpt, ready for export, and yes I could spend the next couple of hours creating a low poly version of this mesh that I can more easily mark out seams to UV unwrap, but don't be silly, I'm not gonna bother with any of that today. Instead I'm going to be skipping that whole shebang and just selecting the entire high poly mesh and selecting smart UV project from the Blender UV tools and hitting OK. And we're done. Now this might or might not be sacrilege to some of you watching, but I found that spending all the extra time required to quote unquote do this properly doesn't really add anything to the final render, which at the end of the day is all I care about. Yes, I know the seams might be all over the place and there might be too many of them in weird places, but the way the substance painter handles texture projection pretty much negates all of these issues. So with unwrapping done, I just export my model as an FPX and start importing it into substance. A really important thing during the entire texturing phase is having a quick and easy way to hop between substance and your render engine of choice, with your intended lighting to really preview how your work is going to actually look. After the mesh is imported and I make sure there is no geometry issues, I start setting up the scene. Mostly by picking out a neutral environment that won't interfere with the colors in the textures. Tomoko Studio is a pretty good one that also has some nice contrast. I tweak some other settings like anti-aliasing and sRGBF color profile for even more contrasty goodness. Now the next very important stage is making all the mesh maps and the way I do it is I just hit the bake mesh map button, set your resolution, in my case it's 4K, and hit OK and just watch the computer do its thing. These mesh maps is what's going to allow me to use all the various masks and size substance, which are, in my opinion, the strongest feature the software has to offer. Smart masks are the basis for adding all the really snazzy effects like edge wear, cavity grime, a coating of dust on the top surfaces, etc. Now, after waiting for the baking process to complete, we check out each individual mesh map to make sure there's no glaring issues with any of them. Basically, you're watching out for any weird artifacts or anything else that might catch your eye. Usually they are pretty easy to spot. I had a couple around the teeth area that I took into Photoshop and cleaned up later. These are probably related to me being lazy in the UV unwrapping phase, but I find that fixing all these small issues in Photoshop is significantly faster than going back into re-sculpting these areas or creating a new high poly mesh. Now that we're done baking, we can actually start the texturing process. With my image reference handy on my second monitor, I start working on the main bone material, starting with these base layers where I define all its base values like color and roughness. The next step is adding some layers with a grunge texture and color applied to them. What this will do is break up the base color so it's more interesting. I pick some saturated yellow and red hues for this purpose since I'm going for a very yellowed and weathered look. The next stage is to apply some grunge again, but this time to the roughness or the surface finish of the material. This is a really important step and it's going to make the model really pop, especially as light moves across the scene or in glancing angles. I just apply a fill layer and add some grunge dust texture set to affect the roughness channel, then play with the opacity until it looks nice. One really important thing is to make sure your textures are set to triplanar projection. What this does is apply a soft gradient to blend the textures together so you don't get any nasty seams like you would on the default UV setting. Definitely an essential setting when doing texture work like this, and one of the main reasons I don't worry too much in the UV unwrapping phase, since triplanar is basically my get out of jail free card so to speak. After the roughness, the next channel to break up is the height. Here I'm adding a subtle noise texture as a mask that is said to affect the height channel. This is what's going to make the skull bumpy pretty much everywhere and what will serve as a good base when we start adding cracks and more localized dimples and such. Now that we've successfully made all the three channels more interesting, those being color, roughness, and height, we can move on to the fun part, masks. These basically allow you to mask out and only affect certain parts of the mesh 
in whatever layer you're using them in. This is where the cool and interesting effects really start coming in, and that's going to make the skull really come to life. Anyways, the goal with these masks for now is to add differentiation in the concave and convex areas of the mesh. For the concave areas, I want to make the colors darker to simulate maybe grime and dirt getting inside the crevices. And for the convex or more prominent edge areas, I want to add lighter values to highlight them and make the geometry of the skull pop up more. I accomplished this using a dust, dirty, and a curvature mask respectively. Then I play with the sliders until the black and white mask values are where I want them to be at. Now for a while here, I'm just going to be playing around with different masks and really starting layering the effects I want. I start with larger bumps in the hide channel to complement the smaller ones we did earlier. Then I layer even more smaller but more pronounced holes using mask with 3D noise. And then I layer even more holes except this time they will be painted on using grunge stains brush by hand in specific areas of interest. Like the brow ridge and the... Like, I guess maybe just the brow ridge I guess? It's been a while. These are meant to mimic all the huge amount of dimples you usually see on skulls in the central brow area. Not sure why exactly they're there, but all I know is that they are there. At this point, I feel like I'm in a good spot to move on to the teeth material. Even though I'm not done with the bone, I feel it helps me to move on to something else just to keep the process interesting and not allow me to get tunnel vision and end up adding 17 million layers of different kinds of dimples for hours on end. For the teeth, I start a new folder and just crudely mask out with a paint layer the teeth so that every layer in that folder only affects them. I'm not super worried about perfectly masking everything since I'll probably go in and tidy this mask later. So, very anticlimactically, I just copy and paste all the layers from the bone into the teeth layer and just tweak them from there. I'm not messing around with too much, only some of the colors to differentiate them a bit from the skull itself. The major difference from the skull and the teeth material is I'm adding a linear gradient so that the teeth appear to yellow out the closer they are to their roots. A subtle effect, but one that is going to add a lot of believability, especially once we get to see these in Blender with their subsurface scattering. And with that, the teeth are pretty much done, and I move on to finish the skull. One thing I saw in a lot of my reference was these interesting red hues inside the major cracks of the skull. To recreate this effect, I use Sand Cavity Smart Mask to fill in the crevices, then manually paint out the rest of the skull so it only affects those cracks specifically, and then go ahead and apply a red color to it. And finally, to literally top it all off, I add a nice dusting of dust to the top surfaces of the skull using a dust mask. And now the skull is done, and we can move on to the non-organic material of this project, the chalice metal. Just like the bone, I start a new folder and start masking out the chalice itself. This one is a little more complex due to all the wacky tendrils enveloping the skull. Once the masking process is finally done, I apply a steel ruined base material to use as a starting point for my metal. I basically apply the material then go through each layer and decide which I want to keep and which I want to get rid of. The process is pretty similar as the bone, I employ heavy use of smart masks to differentiate concave areas to add dirt and grime, and convex areas to highlight edges to bring more artificial contrast to the material. The main deviation from the base steel ruined material is I want to add a peeling coat of yellow to the metal to better tie it to the yellow in the skull using a mask to highlight just the edges. 
I finished this material up by just sprinkling a heavy coating of dust to really sell the vibe and with that we are mostly done with the texturing process. Hopping over to Blender, here we have the skull with all the exported textures from Substance all imported and connected to each appropriate node in the principal BSDF material. It's not rocket science, you just plug in the base color to the color input, the roughness to the roughness input, metallic to metallic, etc. you get the picture. The main thing I want to do is I want to add the subsurface scattering to the skull and teeth only. To do this I export the teeth and metal mask I hand painted in Substance and import that into Blender, combine them using a mix RGB node so that I can control the values, and then use the output as a subsurface scattering mask so I can get scattering only in the areas I want it in. Basically areas in fully black will have no subsurface scattering and areas in white will have the full effect. I tweak with the mix RGB node and some brightness and contrast nodes to get the chalice areas fully black, the skull somewhat white, and the teeth fully white in the mask. Hopefully you can see how the subsurface scattering is indispensable to sell the believability of the organic materials and how it really takes these shaders to the next level. After what feels like hours of tinkering with the contrast and brightness values of the textures in Blender, I slap a few simple lights with the main light being a spotlight to mimic the lighting in the 2D Bloodborne sprite. We're going for a really moody lighting here, so I encase the scene in a cube and add a volume scatter material to it to introduce some nice fog in the scene. Like subsurface scattering, I think volume scatter for these types of scenes are pretty And with that, we are pretty much done with the texturing process. Our skull boy is looking all nice and bony and ready to start the smoke simulation process in the next part of this series. Stay tuned for that video in the coming days or weeks maybe? We'll see. Anyways, until next time.